we're already talking now, so I'm just gonna scrap whatever intro I had and just use this, and we're just gonna get right to it. So, what's up, everyone? My name is Colton Denning, and you are listening to the Two Stripes Podcast, the podcast that covers everything happening in the world of college football. And as you can see by the title on this here episode, I'm gonna be talking about Wisconsin football today, and I am joined by my esteemed guest, a friend. I, I We've never met, but I consider him a friend. He's also a co-author, a former pro wrestler. He helps run Bucky's fifth quarter. He's a handyman around the house. He's a dad. There is not a damn thing in this world that this man can't do. His name is Jake Kokorowski. Jake, pleasure to have you on the show. We've talked on the Land Grant Show, but first time on the Two Stripes podcast. I am humbled and honored for you to uh, join me on the show. Oh man, you are too nice out. That's a hell of an intro, brother. I appreciate you there. Uh, yeah, no, it's been, uh, thank you for making time for me and for dealing it for those that maybe behind the curtain, uh, I've been dealing with, uh, installing a microwave for the better part of three hours. So I appreciate Colton making, you know, allowing me to have a couple extra minutes to make sure everything was snug and tight and not going to fall off and deck my oven and destroy everything in my kitchen so appreciate him and i can't take all the credit for pro wrestler i'll say <laughs> indie wrestler in training just so that uh any of the boys in the back back in my day back 10 15 years ago don't have any heat on me because it's been a while but it's, it's been good man i appreciate you uh, having me on uh, listen i'll take the heat i'm uh judging by our podcast reviews on the land grant show i am a heat magnet so we're just nice. gonna we're just gonna roll with that, but we are not here to talk about Ohio State. We are here to talk about another Big Ten school, and that is the Wisconsin Badgers. And the best place to I think start with Wisconsin is just coming off of last year in where we were at at this time in 2018. Wisconsin was in a little bit of a different place than they usually are, and they were like one of the the hot teams. They were one of the trendier teams. They were a lot of teams or a lot of people's playoff pick to get in, and things didn't necessarily work out that way. They finished eight and five. They were nineteenth in S and P plus. Before we talk about this year in spring, what was it like following Wisconsin last year and, and kind of keeping up with them and and writing about them because it was just everything seemed off. It, it wasn't your usual Wisconsin team that we've seen. They had won 10 plus games in four straight seasons. And then last year, starting with that BYU game, everything just kind of felt off. Yeah, it, it was an interesting year. You had we thought with the team, we knew the, the defense carried the team in 2017. There are a lot of new faces uh, you had players. Uh, there are injuries on the defensive line that I think really hurt. Uh, that hurt the production. You had guys like Caden Lyles, a guy like Caden Lyles who was an offensive lineman, a four-star offensive lineman. He selflessly heads over the defensive line to to eat up some snaps and reps. Uh, he in, instantly he was working with the first team in in spring ball or something not for spring ball but fall camp, which told us something about just the what they thought about the quality of depth at that position for last year. Um, and, and then uh, we at Heidel, I think a lot of us in the media thought highly of the offense, and that did not come to fruition. Alex Hornibrook did not take the steps forward that we saw in the 2018, you know, 17 Orange Bowl, where he threw for 260 some odd yards, 258 yards, and four touchdowns against the Hurricanes. And there, the offense did not progress to the uh, an offensive firepower that was more balanced. You know, Jonathan Taylor got his yards. But the passing game was bad, you know, was not great. And then on top of that, you know, the, the head injury, the Alex Hornibrook that kept him out for, you know, for four games, it that that hurt too. And so it was interesting because we thought there enough, there's enough defensive leadership to withstand the losses that I didn't think they'd be a top ten team, but that they could be a top twenty, top twenty five team that could lend them to getting back to Indianapolis for the t championship game. But we thought that the offense could carry the team, and that was not the case. And I think that's where this year is going to be a really interesting to see. Um, I think the defense is going to be far better. Uh, with all you know, a year stronger, players are are getting better on that on that unit. But it'll be interesting to see now without Hornybrook, who's going to be going to Florida State. Um, and I had a chance to watch those quarterbacks in seven of the eight open practices that have been open to the media. It will be interesting to see who leads the offense, but also there are a lot of questions on the offensive line in terms of who will start. But you know, and if they can, the biggest question with that group, I'm not really 
worried about who will necessarily step, you know, like step up and just uh, if they can get to that level or close to the level that you saw from the run game last season with a, a guy like, you know, having let open those holes for Jonathan Taylor, who rushed for over 2,000 yards last season. Season Just in reading about them this offseason and throughout spring ball, I've seen at least one player reference how maybe they weren't looking ahead or they got full of themselves, but hearing everybody talk about how good they were kind of got into their, may have gotten into their heads a little bit. What do, do you feel like, this team, which has considerably less hype coming out of spring ball, and I would assume that'll stay the same as we head closer to fall practice and then the 2019 season. Do you think that they just feel more comfortable with kind of where they're at right now, where people know what they can do? They know that Jonathan Taylor is going to be good. They know that there's probably going to be guys along that front seven on defense, and despite having to replace four guys on the offensive line we know what wisconsin linemen can do do they just feel more comfortable you think kind of in anonymity at least to start a year i think wisconsin's always been i think wisconsin fans feel more comfortable being the hunter than the hunted and and maybe that's the best way to put it with the big 10 west we all thought they would hold the crown and obviously that went to the northwestern team that caught fire in the Big Ten West going with 8-1 and one in, in conference play. But it, it's really uh, this team, you, you talk, if I'm not mistaken, I talked to the players, you know, we had some ch- opportunities to talk to some players early on, and it just sounds like some of the players, um, there's an ability, I mean, you saw it on the field too, where they're, there's more. I don't know. I don't know if you can say more serious, but you mean they mean business, and and they're gonna they're gonna go and um, you know try to take care of things on the field. You're seeing. I, th- I think combined too with some of that younger talent, and you got to go and and really, in my opinion, I, I feel like this team. Uh, they experienced playing time last year, like in the secondary. I guess maybe is one. Uh, one unit in particular, they wanted guys to play or they wanted to play because there are opportunities with Nick Nelson and Derek Tindall out. However, uh, it's one thing between playing, this is what Jim Leonard said in mid-April, it's one thing between playing and another thing between playing well. Uh, or, or basically just having a distinction of you're on the field, but you, know, you have to cut down on those you know, mistakes. And I feel that really with the team, you know, this team this year, there some people have tasted that playing time now. Uh, the units are making strides, and even without guys on defense like Ryan Connolly and TJ Edwards, they have guy, you know, they have replacements like Chris Orr, who has game a lot of game experience, but also a, a former four star kid in Jack Sanborn, uh, that have stepped up. I but I feel that this team now that the hype is gone. I think they're even getting down to business more and we'll just see how, you know, we'll see how it pays off because they have a tough schedule. Uh, the three crossover games uh, are Ohio state at Columbus in mid October, but then you also have Michigan and Michigan state, you know, late September, early October. So it's going to be a tough battle for them uh, to, along with whatever's in the big 10 West. And I think there are four to five teams that could potentially be division champs coming out of that big 10 West. So but I think this is where this might be in their wheelhouse more, in my opinion. I, I really feel that this team, I think, uh, realizes what happened last year for those that have come back. Uh, and now, you know, it's to me, I think Wisconsin as a program as a whole always had that little bit of the underdog mentality. Uh, maybe that feel to it. I don't know if they necessarily feel that way, but uh, it just seems like from the outside of the program looking in, they thrive being the hunters rather than the, than the hunted. You mentioned being around in spring and watching the quarterbacks and that battle to replace Alex Hornibrook as the next starter. What were your big takeaways from watching them in spring ball? Yeah, really it is um, with this quarterback position group, Jack Cohn, who's the rising junior, he's the one that played in five games. He burned his red shirt uh, so he's a rising junior, a true junior. He took all of his reps were with the first team. Now there are other technically first team reps you could call that, and and the offensive line. I mean, basically there are players out on the offense that uh, when you say first team, you know they're missing two of their best offensive play uh, offensive linemen. 
uh, Tyler Biotish and Cole Van Lannan for the entire summer, or uh, spring, I should say. But then on top of that, um, some of the wide receivers were injured at times too. But you know, you, I call them first team line just because of the offensive line. And sometimes you saw guys like Jonathan Taylor or, or Garrett Groshick, uh, who were the main contributors at that position, uh, playing at the same time. However, I mean, Cone, all of his reps were necessarily f- first team. I thought towards the end he threw the best that I I've, I've seen him throw. He was driving the ball downfield, which was a criticism of him last year as he was trying as a sophomore. Where this is really his first time commanding the offense in in significant, meaningful game time situations, and and all of his starts were on the road or on a neutral field too. So uh, even though he got in at Rutgers at home, that, that was in the start. That was in the second half. But uh, I just feel this. I really feel this uh, battle will be interesting because Cohen looked really good. He's got the leadership component to it. He has the most experience. I think going into fall camp, he'll have those first team reps. But I also think, you know, guys like Graham Mertz, who's the the hype train was huge. You saw him in the All-American Bowl, five touchdown passes. Guy was on a roll, um, has a good head on his shoulders from what, from, you know, from a media perspective. Saying all the right things, he knows he has to improve. He's but he he's got the intangibles to be the quarterback at Wisconsin, uh, if not this year for sure. Next season, he has an accurate ball. John, uh, the position coach John Budmeyer mentioned that he really is. Uh, you know, he he doesn't have to think when he throws, which means he's just accurate. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, yeah, it's just he's made some great throws. There's a dart of a pass to Garrett Groshek that. He threaded the needle on for a touchdown pass in, in one of the scrimmage sessions. He's led a couple of touchdown drives during those scrimmage sessions when maybe a couple of the quarterbacks haven't. And so you see it all there. It's just a matter of him getting used to the playbook, him working on timing with the receivers, which is what you do during the spring, but also just, you know, this getting used to college life. He, he should be a high school senior right now, but he enrolled early. But yet he's still in this baptism by fire type situation where he's being thrown everything at him. And he's he's keeping up, and in my opinion, for a couple, of them, I think he might be the number two heading into fall camp. But you know, there's also guys, you know, Danny Vandenboom got in three games last year. Not he isn't the flashiest out of the four quarterbacks competing, but you know, he he's a proven winner both at the high school, you know, at the high school level. He's part of multiple state championships. His dad's a former Badger, and but he's he's got an accurate ball and he's smart with where to go and he knows what he can and can't do. But the most dynamic, I think, my opinion, arguably, the most dynamic quarterback in that room is Chase Wolf, which Vandenboom and Wolf might be the most, you know, kind of the forgotten guys be behind Cone and Mertz. But really, you know, like he Wolf is from the Cincinnati area. I, I know Ohio State tried to flip him according to reports, and he denied, you know, he said he was sticking with Wisconsin. Kid can run, he's mobile, he can escape the pocket. And his arm strength might be the strongest out of all four of them. Now, it's a matter of his decision-making that's going to – whether or not he'll get the reps. But I've been impressed by him and his ability to escape, gain some yards on the run. And his arm, I mean, he's – like I said, he's got the strongest arm, I think, out of the group. So um, it's just a matter of his decision-making and continuing to progress as a redshirt freshman as well. Uh, we'll see if what he can do, you know, potentially in either, you know, beating out Cone or even – you know, beating out Mertz, try to be the, the main backup. Uh, so it's been interesting to watch. And, you know, spring ball will never be, you know, at least in Wisconsin, in my opinion, you're not going to see a starter named in this type of competition until fall camp. And so they're allowed to make these mistakes, work on timing, get better, and then fall camp, you know, you'll, uh, there will be development here. And their performances in spring ball will dictate how many reps they get in fall camp. But there's a lot of opportunities to develop Uh, And they didn't want the quarterbacks to, you know, we're going to cut these guys' reps halfway through spring ball. That's not what Paul Christ and John Budmeyer and Joe Rudolph wanted. They wanted the guys to really, you know, develop and learn and progress. And then, I mean, they'll have to make decisions on fall camp. But um, the reps were split pretty evenly, in my opinion. And we'll see how it plays out, but it's it's been really interesting to watch. Whoever wins that quarterback job is going to have one of the best weapons in the country to work with. And running back Jonathan Taylor, who has rushed for over 4,100 yards in his first two seasons, which is just absolutely disgusting. Nobody nobody does that. So I don't feel like we have to really spend a lot of time talking about him because we know what he brings to the table 
And you look at the rest of the offense and four new offensive linemen are coming in. And that's been a story just in, in my research of them this off season is people talking about that. But from the outside looking in, if I ever look at Wisconsin and there's one place where I could be like, you could bring on a bunch of walk-ons, pardon the, the reference to your book, but you could just bring <laughs> on a bunch of dudes and they would play well. It's on offensive line at Wisconsin. So to me, the most intriguing thing about the offense outside of whatever this quarterback battle is going to be is wide receiver because last year before the season they lost Quintez Cephas and it seems like they never really recovered from that and they've always tended to have one dude whether it's Jared Aberderis or somebody that can just make plays and it seems like last year that was missing Who's going to be that guy for this year's team, and what are some names to watch out for? I mean, in the past, again, I think A.J. Taylor is the big one. He's a senior. Um, he At times, he became Alex Hornibrook's, you know, one of his favorite targets. Uh, and he, this spring, uh, you know, I did a roundtable with a bunch of the beat writers for uh, a local radio uh, network here, radio station here in town. And, you know, you know, a, lot, a couple of the guys mentioned him as, a, as the MVP. I think he's a player that really could – Stand out, uh, and I, th- you know, th- I mean, there's a trio of wide receivers essentially. In um, you have Taylor, Danny Davis, Kendrick Pryor. Those are kind of the top three guys at, at the wide receiver position. Davis in 2017 was a deep ball guy. He made like a 50 yard reception against BYU. He made contested catches against Miami. He made them against Ohio State in the Big Ten Championship game. But last year, his yards per catch dropped significantly down from, I think it was like 14 to 15 yards per catch in 2017, down to about 10 in 2018. So I think for him, and I believe he led the team in receptions, if I'm not mistaken, um, it's one of those things where uh, this team, uh, in my opinion, uh, you know, like they need to get him the ball, uh, make him a deep threat, and uh, yeah, you know, and also like basically establish him more. And he was suspended for the first two games of the season as well, uh, in, in connection with the the Cephas situation with uh, being charged. Uh, Cephas was charged with uh, two counts of sexual assault, and his trial is actually in late July. They rescheduled it for so, um, but you know Davis came back after two games after being suspended, uh, and he still led the team in catches, but those yards per catch really dropped. Prior, I'm really intrigued to see what he can do. He can go on those end arounds, but he could also catch. He had that uh, big 35-yard touchdown against Miami. And so I'm I'm waiting for him to take off a little bit more there. I think the biggest name, though, possibly in the passing game, though, Colton, is a guy like Jake Ferguson. Uh, of course, if you haven't heard, and I'm sure you guys will hear this now, but you also hear it during the season. So feel free to take a shot uh, as customary in Wisconsin. He is Barry Alvarez's grandson, uh, one of two. <laughs> and so Joe played a safety as a safety for Wisconsin uh, and graduated two seasons ago. And now Jake Ferguson's the – he's going to be a Richard sophomore. He, I think he's an NFL caliber tight end. Could be – I think he could be better than Troy Fumagalli. He emerged as a second-year player and being a real uh, significant third down receiving target. And I think that'll continue this year. I think there'll be more rapport with either Jack Cohn or one of the other quarterbacks if they win out. He really, I think, is an NFL caliber player, and he will be dependent upon, I'm sure defenses are going to lock in on what he can do in the field. And he's still working, you know, every Wisconsin tight end needs to block, and he's worked on that as well. So we'll see what comes of the passing game there. But those are the kind of the big-name targets. And it'll be interesting to see if they get the running backs in. Uh, you see Jonathan Taylor got a lot of work during spring ball last year. Uh, also, I believe in fall camp last year, trying to work out of the backfield. Uh, he, he didn't have that much of an impact. He only had six receptions uh, or eight receptions, 60 yards. And the longest was a 30-yarder. So he didn't really establish himself well. But a guy like Garrett Groshek showed in spring ball this year in the past four weeks that he has an opportunity to to do something with the ball out of the backfield. He had a 43 yard screen pass for a touchdown uh, that he caught in the season opener last year. But um, I think he could be even a more viable threat on a third down back or a down and distance type back that he is uh, on 11 personnel. He could be an option too. I was going to say, I feel like Barry Alvarez is going to come strike us down for being so unbalanced and talking nothing but offense. But if we talk about the grandson a little bit, we might be okay. But on the subject of that defense, there really wasn't what we're accustomed to seeing from them 
the way they played last year, it was just odd watching them them go out and really by their standards struggle. I want to say they finished like 29th in defensive S&P plus, which for a lot of teams would be really good. But Wisconsin's standard of defense is a little bit higher. What's the talk been this spring about the defense, about what Jim Leonard's doing and about some of the next wave of playmakers they have coming in? Yeah, it's really uh, I think this defense is going to be improved from last year. And I think it all starts with the the defensive line. It's progressed. It's developed. Uh, There's more experience. You know, those guys, a guy like Matt Henningsen is uh, he has start, you know, he played 13 games. I believe he started 10 of those games as a walk on redshirt freshman, which, you know, on that type of line, you don't necessarily want, but uh, that was due to the injury of Garrett Rand, and he worked his way back in, and he was, you know, he did limited position work. He didn't do, uh, from what I saw, any team reps, but he really stood out in that facet where, uh, you know, I, I think that he's a strong guy. He knows how, uh, he, I mean, this guy's about 270, and he can throw defenders around. He's one of the strongest guys out there. His bench, I forgot how much he could bench, but it was it was significantly more than I will ever have probably by double. Uh, but then you have, you know, I think the defensive line is going to be improved with Rand being healthy and Isaiah Loudermilk, who's a six, seven, 300 pounder. Uh, that that's kind of the mold of what they want as a defensive end at Wisconsin. Those two can really uh, solidify the line with Bryson Williams, who will take over for Olive Sangapalu. And he had experience last year after Sangapalu had a season ending in- injury. Uh, I, I think that the line is going to be key, but uh, I also see things like, like I mentioned earlier, I don't think inside linebacker is going to be that much of a problem. Uh, I like Orr. I like Sam Bourne. I like the guys behind them. Mike Mascalunas, if he can stay healthy, is a viable backup, and he's a walk-on. Leo Chanel is a true freshman in year in Rowley that's really surprised uh, all of us. Uh, he's a name to possibly watch for rotational work, in my opinion. 6'2", 239 already as a true freshman. He put up 32 uh, reps of 225 before spring ball. So physically, he is ready. And when you go next to him, he looks the part. Uh, we'll see how much. I mean, the mentality part of the, the mental part of the game is going to be huge for him continuing to pick up. But the coming in during the spring obviously helps. Um, secondary, I think safety is the strongest part of the group. Uh, strongest unit of the team, actually, I'll say. Uh, it, uh, there's a two deep there that of contributors. I like Eric Burrell and Scott Nelson who got time last year and significant t- um, time. And then also a guy like Reggie Pearson, who's going to be a sophomore kid out of Michigan that hits hard, had some pass breakups, had some interceptions, uh, during the spring. Uh, and then you have a transfer in Colin, uh, Wilder who came from Houston. He's worked himself into the two deep already. Uh, I like his chances and, and cornerback. There's a lot of, uh, it's with that group that had to replace Nick Nelson and Derek Tindall from the 2017 team that was so dominant defensively. I think there's six. I mean, last year six guys started. It's a it literally you have a three deep of players that can play those positions. I, I almost you know, I would say a three and a half deep. There, I think there's seven viable cornerbacks potentially that that are that will be more experienced and. Uh, they're hungry now. Jim Leonard said, you know, they're they were a little inconsistent. They've made huge strides from where they were last year, uh, but you know, he says, you know, when they make a mistake or when they're they're, some, they're in there inconsistent, it's that much more frustrating because they've made more flashy plays. You've seen some interceptions, but then um, you've made they've made mistakes too. Uh, so uh, a lot of people think it may be a strength of the team. Right now, I'm still skeptical about the cornerbacks because they've kept rotating in and out, in and out, in and out uh, for these different combinations throughout the spring, which is, you want to see, see what they can do. This is what the time to test them, but it'll be interesting to see really who solidifies their roles uh, at that position coming up in, in August. Uh, but lastly, outside linebacker, that's the big one. You replace outside uh, outside linebacker Andrew Van Ginkle. Uh, Zach Bond, I think he'll have a breakout year. I think he's healthier now. If he can stay healthy, he's about 6'3", 230, uh, and, and he's very athletic. And I think he can, he'll get to the pass. Uh, he'll get to the quarterback more in the pass rush. Next to him, I mean, I think the, that's maybe the, big, the second biggest question of the defense right now is, is figuring out who's going to take over at uh, outside linebacker next to him. They have a couple candidates that popped out to me in both a base and a nickel scheme. But then again, like I said, it's just spring. We'll see how they can turn it up in August. 
Who's the one guy that nobody's talking about right now that by the end of the season, everybody's going to be like, oh, look, Wisconsin has a first-team All-American on defense? Ooh. Scott Nelson pops instantly in my mind. He's a free safety type. About, I think about six, he's a tall safety, about six, one, six, two. Very, he's athletic. He can patrol. I mean, he was injured a lot last year too. And I think that was something to watch for. Uh, just make sure if he's maintains his health, but uh, he in fall camp last year was a ball hawk and he didn't see, I mean, he had only, I think only one interception last year, but I think he's improved. Jim Leonard likes the group at safety. He said they've, they've come a long way. Uh, when we spoke to him in mid-April, so uh, they've made leaps in that area, uh, in that in their phases and then de- in their development of the games. I would say Scott Nelson, but I'm trying to think. Bond may be the other one. I don't want everyone to discount uh, discount Chris Orr because Chris has an ability. He's going to be a fifth-year senior. He was a starter before he got injured back during the 2016 season. And then Ryan Conley and TJ Edwards kind of manned. They started the, the right, most, most of the games the next two seasons, even though Orr had a pick six in, against Nebraska in 2017. And, but he's got experience. Uh, and, he, and he played well in the pinstripe bowl when Conley was out after he tore his abdomen muscles off of his pubic bone is what he told us. Uh, Conley did. Whew. Yeah, basically that's what it turned out to be. It was a gradual injury that – got worse and worse and worse and Conley basically played most of the, you know, he played the season with that ab injury, that core injury. Uh, and he's fully healed. He got drafted by the giants this past weekend, but, um, but or stepped in and had eight tackles, uh, tackle for loss. I think, believe he had an interception as well. So really it, it's, uh, I think N- Nelson's got that potential to be, an, to be an all conference, possibly all American type safety. In my opinion, I, my opinion, it, or might be the next next one closest. I still, when you have that type of honor and that you know the distinction that you're mentioning, it's hard with this group because it's still, no matter the development that I saw or others saw, this team, this group still, I don't see. I still want to wait to see how it plays out during fall camp because the group did surrender. Some plays they lost a lot uh, of their leadership with with Edwards, who was an All American, and Conley, who I feel is vastly underrated from last season. So I'm still kind of waiting to see. But if there's someone, I would probably say with potential, probably Nelson right now. Let's talk about the schedule because this slate is rough. A lot of people have criticized Wisconsin for their schedules in the past, and I, I do not think that anybody could be able to do that. This season, like you mentioned, they play those crossover games against Michigan at Ohio State and against Michigan State. They also play at Nebraska in conference play and even to start the season road game at USF, which you you could do a lot worse than that. That'll be a good test to start the year. And for me, we we talked about being more locked in and having less hype. I, I think for them. You, you you said it. This is right in their wheelhouse. To me, the best Wisconsin teams, you've always looked at something like that and been like, well, is this the year that they really fall off? And they just play solid football throughout the year. And yeah, this is a super tough schedule. And coming off of their 2018, I, I could see how a lot of people could be skeptical, especially given that they're breaking in a new quarterback, have some new offensive line pieces, and some of the other departures that they have to fill. But to me, in just some odd, only this applies to Wisconsin sort of way, this seems like this is their type of year that they covet, where they can have these type of challenges and play tough teams on the road and be able to try to grind wins out in Big Ten play. Yeah, it really, I I think this team will be more, I don't know if I want to, I think you could say focused. You'd think that they're focused throughout um the season and you know i really feel that you know it, it's a it's a thing where i'm trying to even th- think back to the 2017 season which i think people knew i don't know if they had the hype i think people within the program knew and with the schedule that they had it was they could have gone undefeated in the regular season which they did they did but yeah i think the team you know the program Maybe even the fan base, and maybe they're more used to it. Uh, the you know, and from the outside looking in, what, of being 
the, maybe the the chip on the shoulder that you know you talk about you hear about Alabama where Nick Saban you know the, the lot you know he'll try to conjure up something of us versus them or something like that um just to kind of play that chip on the shoulder card I think Wisconsin I think the fan base is more used to it in that sense and with you know going up I mean it's gonna be you know you, the, the schedule I mean the third game in they have Michigan at home and that's after I mean the, it's technically the fourth week because they have a bye they have two bye weeks actually uh, this season but it's their first bye week is after this you know a home giving a Central Michigan but they take on Michigan you know at the end of September and then it's Michigan State um, and even going to South Florida it's gonna be I played. I had two day football practices when I lived in Cape Coral, Florida, and it was unbearable. Going ninety degree heat, ninety five degree heat, hundred percent humidity. It's a different. You know, no matter how hot it is up yeah. here in Wisconsin, and it gets hot up here. I mean, there are days ninety five to hundred degrees. Uh, you know, we have our certain heat waves, and the humidity can get high. My air conditioner is running. I'm, you know, I'm dishing out money for my air conditioning just to make it you know get down to 75 80 degrees in my house but it is uh it's a different type of heat down in florida uh and that's something michael Dieter and andrew van ginkle will actually have to experience now as members of the miami dolphins uh, but it, it's going to be interesting to see how the badgers respond there and also if i'm not mistaken uh one of our colleagues jeff patricus from the law Journal pointed out to this uh, a couple weeks ago you know they have a new offensive coordinator the bulls do where and it's kerwin bell who uh, and from what I from what he described sounds like that the offensive schemes there uh, are pretty interesting and, and could gain a lot of yardage for the for the Bulls. However, I will say it is the first game of the year, and we all know uh, teams aren't perfect that first you know, that first week. So maybe Wisconsin's looking out there, but it, you know it's a tough road game to start off with. I'll be down there in Tampa. You'll also have uh, though you know. Yeah, Contest at Nebraska with a revamped Scott Frost offense. Who I think Adrian Martinez could have a breakout year if he doesn't have a sophomore slump. They have some questions there. Um, you have to go to Minnesota, uh, and in my opinion, uh, it's hard for me to make a accurate read on them. They're playing tough at the end of the year, especially with that new defensive coordinator. Um, so we'll see if Wisconsin can reclaim the axe, and that could be a game that decides the division, really. Iowa's got a lot of questions. Northwestern may have a five-star transfer quarterback, but they're also you know, going to replace three offensive linemen and their super back, along with uh, trying to figure out what's going to happen in the secondary. So it's going to be interesting, uh, but I think this is the type of, as you go, going back to your question, going back to how you stated it with Wisconsin liking where they're at, I think this is a year that Wisconsin could be uh, could take home the division title. Uh, but, I mean, right now I'm saying Nebraska – and I was hesitant to say Wisconsin because I didn't want to sound like a homer, but they absolutely could have a shot uh, to capture the division title when all is said and done. That Michigan game in week four is the game I'm most looking forward to in college football this season. I feel like I can spot a 13-10 Wisconsin win from a couple of miles out. Them after a bye against a Michigan team who I think is playing Air Force and someone else in their first two weeks with that new offense, whatever it is they're running under Josh Gaddis against a Wisconsin team that can get creative on defense, bring some pressure. I know a Wisconsin 13-10 win when I see one, and that is one right there. And I'm not saying that only because it would just be hilarious for me as an Ohio State fan, but that's that's one where I think that Wisconsin wins that game. And then that confidence that we were talking about and forgetting about last year, that kind of shoots up for them. So I, I'm super excited for that game. I mean, that Michigan game, I mean, the, the new offense that I think it's an RPO-based offense of Josh Gaddis that is bringing from Alabama, uh, I think it's sorely needed for Michigan uh, when it comes to just the way they ran. Even though they won in convincing fashion against Wisconsin and the final score it took them until the third, late in the third quarter for the wheels to fall off of uh, Wisconsin altogether. Um, but – yeah, I think that's going to be huge. I think they're still going to be working through some things through four weeks. And I think Wisconsin gets them at a good time, especially at home. And, but we'll see how that plays out uh, there. If Wisconsin can pull off a win there, I think that's a that would be huge for them. Uh, and Obviously, it's the first conference game of the year, and it set off the right tone. But then it also helps in the divisional race. Where I mean the division with the Big Ten West, there could be a three team. Um, I think there's going to be the winner is going to have three losses in division, at least two, 
uh, possibly three. And I think, you know, um, there's a possibility. I mean, we'll see what whatever type of uh, tiebreakers. My colleague Jason Galloway mentioned it on this podcast, that very reason. The, the tiebreakers, there could be a lot of situations of, you know, you could go down the list and figure out, you know, okay, this conference record for this. I mean, you, know, you have to go down the list to figure out who's going to go to Indianapolis to take on uh, whoever comes out of the Big Ten East. Uh, so um, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be really interesting to see how this team plays out. And I think, yes, yeah, so if they can pull off the win against Michigan, uh, that'll be, I mean, maybe may a home win and people may try to justify it that way. But with the way this team is rebounding from eight, five year, that would set the conference right. That would set their con- their year, their conference year uh, off on the really, really solid foot. Talking about that division is probably a good place for us to wrap up and, and something that I wanted to ask you about because every football season is important so it's hard to just say oh this this season is more important to bounce back than others but for me it really does feel like this season is a very important year for them to play well because you look at the rest of that division and nebraska they're improving we know that scott frost can bring in talent and is a great offensive mind we saw what purdue did last year i got to see that up close in personal with jeff brom northwestern went to the big 10 championship game minnesota is steadily improving behind the scenes you never know what you're going to get year to year with iowa but they are solid enough uh illinois we, we don't have to say anything about illinois they don't count but other than them, it, it really does feel like this division is, it, it's not what it was three years ago when people were laughing at it. There is a lot of teams that are on the uptick. And to me, it really feels like this is the time for Wisconsin to, if they're going to show that they are the true power of that division, it's, it's to do it right now while these teams are on the come up because they've been able to do it when teams have been down in the last half decade and it'll be interesting to see if they're able to reclaim that throne for lack of a better phrase this year when some of those teams are a little bit better and games like that road trip to nebraska are going to be big measuring sticks of that yeah and it's going to be it's tough with this the way the team is began i think you hit it too not just with with the other teams but within wisconsin itself jonathan taylor uh, I mean, I predict him to to leave early after you know after his junior year. I don't think there's any reason for him to stay uh, outside of you know maybe you know if he wants to complete his degree. But I don't know if he could even get that done prior to that. But you know if he's looking to go to the NFL, I don't think he needs another year of 300 touches. Uh, uh you know, heading to the next level. So his, this might be his final year. I, a lot of us are predicting that. But also, guys, under other other under clan for that matter, Tyler Biotish. Cole Van Lannon on the offensive line. Those guys, it depends on how good they have their uh, respective redshirt junior years. They could declare early. So, you know, this could be the year that they they strike, not just, you know, from what they see in the conference and having five or six teams that could compete. Uh, and, and maybe that changes in 2019. Uh, I will say with, with two, the 2020 schedule is, is interesting because they do get Notre Dame uh, at Lambeau. But, you know, their crossover game's a lot easier, quote-unquote, with Indiana at home. They go, they do go to Michigan, but then uh, they also play Maryland in College Park. So, and I know, but things I do know, uh, Mike Loxley over in Maryland uh, could have that program revamped uh, in, in a couple of years, too. So that, they will not be an easy win by any stretch, in my opinion. So, um, you know, it, it will be interesting. It'll also be interesting to see if a guy like Graham Mertz, if he emerges this year in fall camp, or if at next year, you know, he competes and fully takes the reins too, you know, and not to put too much on the true freshman, the four-star kid, but um, I think it'll be interesting to see how he progresses and, and may, you know, we've all seen what college quarterbacks can do, and so if there's a if Wisconsin can find a, a quarterback that can air it out more and alleviate the running game and not have nine or ten guys in the box you know, that's going to help them. If that's next year, that's one thing. If it's 2019, uh, we'll see what Jack Cohn and company can do then too. Well, we could probably talk for another hour about Wisconsin and the Big Ten and how things are going to shake out. But that's, I think that's a good place to put a bow on it. Everybody, please make sure to visit Bucky's fifth quarter.com. Check out all of their great work on Wisconsin football and Wisconsin athletics as a whole. Also follow them on Twitter at 
B5Q. You can read Jake's book that he co-authored, Walk On This Way, The Ongoing Legacy of the Wisconsin Walk-On Football Tradition. I read it a couple off-seasons ago. I need a refresher this off-season, so I'm going to have to ask my mom to send that out here so I can read it again. Testimonials. It is a very good book. Make sure to check that out. You can also listen to Jake on Bucky's fifth podcast and also on Kielbasa Kings, Wisconsin. You're everywhere, man. Where else can they find you? Yeah, man. You can find me on Twitter at jcocoB5Q. You can find me, you know, you can find us at Bucky's fifth quarter. Bucky's fifth podcast is the big one. Owen Reese and I run that podcast. We have a lot of fun with it. Uh, and we'll have uh, Jeff Risden on uh, to talk uh, Bo Benchwall and what his what he can do uh, with the Detroit Lions this week. We'll have that up probably by Friday morning. Uh, and like I said, we'll have tons of spring ball stuff. Uh, tomorrow I'll have a column talking about my biggest concerns for the for the team moving forward uh, and go from there. So, no, I'm uh, we're everywhere on Bucky's fifth quarter. We appreciate our community. It's some of the smartest and, and most constructive uh, fans uh, of the out of all the Badgers, and it, it's been uh, Badgers community, I should say. And we we love having other people come in and talk with us, and, and we have a good dialogue. So feel free to come over to Bucky's fifth quarter, talk with us, uh, and talk to, to us about the the you know Buckeyes and other things too. So we're all we have a good time, uh, to say the least. Yeah, do it. Check out Bucky's fifth quarter. Check out all of Jake's work there. Follow him on Twitter, and be sure to check out this show, the Two Stripes Podcast, SoundCloud.com slash Two Stripes Pod. And if you like this episode, go on to Apple Podcasts. Just search the Two Stripes Podcast. You can find this episode and all the other old episodes there. Please leave me some feedback. You can also follow me on Twitter at Dubsco. That's going to wrap up today's episode. want to thank you one last time for listening. For Jake Kokorowski, I'm Colton Denning. And this is the Two Stripes Podcast.